Hey everyone, it's Nurse Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be talking about respiratory alkalosis. So let's get started. Respiratory alkalosis occurs in the body whenever we have increased lung ventilation. So whenever a patient is increasing their lung ventilation, unfortunately this causes the CO2 level in your body, the carbon dioxide level, to drop down but it causes the pH level to increase. So we now have an alkalotic state in the body. So one of the main causes of respiratory alkalosis is actually called tachypnea. And tachypnea, tach means fast, is a really fast respiratory rate. Typically in adults, this is greater than 20 breaths per minute. So we don't want someone breathing that fast. So let's think about it for a second. You have this person, they are breathing extremely fast. What is coming out of their mouth? What are they exhaling whenever they're breathing really fast? They're exhaling carbon dioxide, CO2. And we don't wanna get rid of too much of this. So to help us understand respiratory alkalosis, let's talk a moment about CO2 and blood pH. So first off, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is this acidic waste product that is produced from cell metabolism. And we have to have cell metabolism in the body because we have to be able to function and have energy. But unfortunately, a result of this process is the creation of carbon dioxide. So our body has to deal with this carbon dioxide it doesn't want too much of it or too little of it. Some of it's a little beneficial because it helps maintain our acid base balance. So in order to deal with it, it takes that carbon dioxide, dumps it into the blood, and the blood, in a sense, acts like this escalator and transports it to the heart, goes to the heart where it's gonna to go to the lungs. And the lungs, the respiratory system, is going to take care of getting rid of what we need to get rid of. So. In gas exchange, when you breathe in, you're taking in oxygen. Your body loves oxygen. It's gonna take that oxygen, cross it over into the blood. Then it's going to cross over carbon dioxide out of the blood and into your lungs, and you're going to exhale that carbon dioxide, getting rid of that acidic substance. And your respiratory system can adjust how fast you inhale or exhale to tweak that carbon dioxide level. So let's talk about when carbon dioxide is actually in the blood because it's really cool. Once carbon dioxide hits the blood, it will bind with water because in your blood you have water. So you have carbon dioxide binding with water. When those two bind, you get the formation of carbonic acid. So I want you to remember carbonic acid because carbonic acid is really formed because we have carbon dioxide binding with water. And if we're not having a lot of carbon dioxide binding with water, we're really going to affect carbonic acid levels. And carbonic acid is a weak acid. And because it's weak, what happens is that whenever you get its formation, it's weak, it just breaks apart. And when it breaks apart, it forms hydrogen ions and bicarb. So hydrogen ions are really important in maintaining our acid base balance. Because without the CO2 and water binding and the formation of carbonic acid, we will affect our hydrogen ions. So let's talk about hydrogen ions and blood pH for a moment. So hydrogen ions are acidic. And if you have too many hydrogen ions, you're gonna have a low blood pH. Your blood pH is gonna be acidic. If you don't have a lot of hydrogen ions, your blood pH is going to be alkalotic. It's going to go up. So hydrogen ions, we measure this through blood pH. That's what we're looking at whenever we're talking about a patient's blood pH level. We're talking about their hydrogen ion concentration. So here with respiratory alkalosis, we have already said that we have a low carbon dioxide level. So when you have a low carbon dioxide level, you don't have a lot of carbon dioxide binding with water. You're not getting the formation of a lot of carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. And therefore, whenever it breaks apart, you're not getting a lot of hydrogen ions. So we're dropping our hydrogen ions, which is increasing our blood pH. So do you see why whenever we have a low CO2 carbon dioxide level, we have a high blood pH, so we have alkalosis. And again, the main cause is tachypnea. So whenever the patient is breathing really fast, they're exhaling that CO2. So what are some conditions or things that could cause your patient to breathe really fast? Well, to help us remember those things, let's remember the word tachypnea. T is for temperature increase fever. So whenever your patient has a really high fever, it can cause them to breathe really fast and blow off CO2, putting them in respiratory alkalosis. A is for aspirin toxicity like salicylates. C for controlled ventilation is too excessive. So we have them on some type of mechanical ventilation. It's just way too fast for them and they're just blowing off too much CO2. 
H is for hyperventilation. Whenever patients get a lot of anxiety, if you've ever seen one, someone having a panic attack or severe anxiety, notice that they really breathe very fast. This can cause this. And then Y is for Yelp. They have pain. Whenever a patient's in pain, it will affect their vital signs. Their heart rate can go up, their blood pressure can go up, along with their respiratory rate. Then P for pneumothorax. This is where we have a collapsed lung. So whenever you have a collapsed lung, that's definitely gonna alter gas exchange and affect how well you can get rid of carbon dioxide. N is for neuro change. We're talking about our brain, like inflammation of the brain or brain injury. We know that there are centers in our brain that control our respiratory rate. So if those are inflamed or damaged, it can affect how the patient breathes, which could cause them to go into an alkalotic state. E is for embolism in the lungs, and then A is for ascending altitude. So whenever you go up in altitude, you have low oxygen. And whenever you have low oxygen, your body's like, hey, I need to breathe some more. So it might try to hyperventilate to try to take in more oxygen. Well, when you're hyperventilating, as we've already talked about, you're gonna blow off too much CO2. Now let's talk about how a patient's arterial blood gases are gonna look whenever they're experiencing respiratory alkalosis. How can you tell whenever you look at that blood gas that your patient has this condition? Well, you wanna look at three specific things. One thing is the blood pH. Again, that pH is telling us the concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood. So a normal blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So whenever we're talking less than 7.35, we're talking about the blood being really acidic. So if it's really acidic, we got a lot of hydrogen ions in there. If it's greater than 7.45, we don't have a lot of hydrogen ions in there, so the blood is alkalotic. And that is the case with respiratory alkalosis. We're gonna have a blood pH of greater than 7.45. Then we wanna look at the PaCO2, which is the concentration of carbon dioxide in that arterial blood. A normal level is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. So with this PaCO2 level, anything that's less than 35 is going to be considered alkalotic. Anything greater greater than 45 is considered acidic. So here we don't have a lot of carbon dioxide, so it's going to be, you'll see results less than 35 millimeters of mercury, which is on the alkalotic side. Then you want to quickly look at the bicarb level, the HCO3. So this tells us if we got some compensation going on. This value can be normal or it could be abnormal. So a normal bicarb level is about 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. So anything with this bicarb when it's less than 22 is considered to be on the acidotic side and anything greater than 26 is on the alkalotic side. So again, it could be normal. If it was normal and all those, the blood pH and the PaCO2 were abnormal showing the values for what it should be for respiratory alkalosis, we would have respiratory alkalosis, no compensation, so it'd be uncompensated. But if this bicarb was less than 22, and we have the abnormal values for blood pH and the PaCO2, which is telling us respiratory alkalosis, and our bicarb is less than 22, we would have partial compensation because this bicarb is trying to make things a little bit more acidic for us. So we can bring that blood pH down because right now it's too high, we need to bring it down. So with compensation, our body has a lot of systems in place to help balance these acids and bases so we can get our blood pH back into 7.35 to 7.45 range. And we have you know, the hydrogen ions, which are our acids, but we also have bases. And a big base in our body that our body likes to use is bicarb, the HCO3. So here in this case, we really have too much basic stuff going on, so we can get the kidneys involved and the kidneys help tweak bicarb and hydrogen ions. So what the kidneys can do is that it can excrete the extra bicarb because we don't need too much of that because we already have alkalosis and it can start to retain hydrogen ions, which again are acidic. So if we're gonna add hydrogen ions back into our blood. We can make it a little bit more acidic and hopefully decrease that blood pH, which is why you're going to start to see this bicarb level start to decrease, get less than 22. So now let's practice an arterial blood gas problem because as you study these concepts, chances are in your exam, you're also gonna have some ABG problems and let's make sure you're prepared for that. 
So I'm gonna be using the tic-tac-toe method to help us solve this problem. And this problem actually comes from my book I just released on ABG interpretation that has a lot of practice problems and some cheat sheet style notes to help you remember these important concepts. So our problem says that the patient has a blood pH of 7.54, a PaCO2 of 30, and a bicarb HCO3 of 20. So first thing what we wanna do is we wanna set up that tic-tac-toe grid. So we're gonna put a column over here with acid, then in the middle we're gonna put normal, and then beside that we're going to put base, and then put our lines so it looks like that tic-tac-toe grid. And then what we're gonna do is we need to analyze that pH. So our pH is 7.54, normal is 7.35 to 7.45. This falls on the really high side, so it's alkalotic, hence is another word for base. So we're gonna put pH under base. Now we're gonna look at that PaCO2. PaCO2 is 30 and normal is 35 to 45. So it's less than 35, it's on the alkalotic base side. So we're gonna put PaCO2 under base. Okay, now let's quickly look at that HCO3 or bicarb. Where does it fall? A normal is 22 to 26, it is actually 20 here. So it's on the acidic side. So we're going to put bicarb HCO3 under acid. Now we need to see if we have a vertical three in a row, and we do. Over here we have base, pH, and PaCO2, and when we put all of that together, we get respiratory alkalosis. Now we need to determine what kind of compensation do we have. We can either have one of three things. We can have uncompensated, partial compensated, or full compensated. Well, there's one thing we can automatically rule out, and that's full compensation. We have no full compensation because our pH is abnormal. We have to have a normal pH to have full compensation, so we'll cross that off. Now, do we have uncompensation or partial compensation? Well, we don't have uncompensation because our HCO3, which would help maybe compensate with things, help tweak that, bicarb and maybe help us retain some hydrogen ions so we can make things a little acidic, it is actually abnormal. So if it was normal, it wouldn't be doing anything. So we could say it's uncompensated. It's not trying to help bring down this blood pH. So there's partial compensation because this HCO3 has actually made itself abnormal and it's went on to the acidotic side. So this is respiratory alkalosis with partial compensation. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of respiratory alkalosis. So we just talked about how they're gonna look on a sheet of paper with their blood gas results. But what are they gonna be presenting with whenever you go in and you look at them? Well, one big sign and symptom you're gonna see, of course, is an increased respiratory rate. You're also gonna to start to see neuro changes as it progresses to get worse. So you could start to see anxiety, especially if this is caused by a panic attack. You're gonna to start to see fear, dizziness, which could progress to seizures in severe cases. In addition, their heart rate can be elevated and you particularly wanna pay attention to this heart rate because they can start to experience ECG changes. And these ECG changes are gonna come from electrolyte imbalances, which can be very serious. So two electrolyte imbalances, I want you to remember that can occur with respiratory alkalosis. They are hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. So we're talking about a low calcium level in the blood and a low potassium level in the blood. So why is this occurring? Well, first let's talk about the low potassium level. So whenever a patient has a low carbon dioxide level in the blood, like in this condition, it causes potassium to move inside that cell, so intracellular which drops our blood levels. Now with calcium, what happens is that whenever the blood pH becomes too alkalotic, it causes calcium to misbehave in a sense. It causes calcium to want to bind to albumin. And when it binds to albumin, it's no longer in our blood. It drops our blood level, so we'll have a low calcium level. Now, because of these electrolyte imbalances, it could cause not only the ECG changes, but your patient could start to have muscle cramping and tetany as well. So what is our role with respiratory alkalosis? What are our interventions and what treatments can we expect to be ordered? So with respiratory alkalosis, the big thing is that we want to find the cause and we want to fix that cause because if the patient's having a fever, let's give them some antipyretics to decrease that fever. If they're having anxiety, let's help get them calm. Whatever it is, you want to find it 
and treat it. So the big thing is, is we want the patient to decrease the respiratory rate and rest, because if we can get them to slow that respiratory rate, it's gonna decrease how much carbon dioxide they are putting out, ex expelling. So to help us remember our role, we're gonna remember the word rest. R is for rebreather mask or paper bag. So just helping them slow down their respiratory rate, it's gonna slow down how much carbon dioxide they're gonna be putting out. So these are very simple things that we can do to help possibly correct that imbalance. E is for electrolytes monitored, particularly again, what were those two big electro electrolytes? They were potassium and calcium. S is for sedatives or anti-anxiety medications to be administered. This is just gonna help calm them down, which when we calm them down, they're gonna decrease their breathing and again, quit hyperventilating. And then T is for teach relaxation and de-stressing techniques. So the big thing, if you have a patient who goes into respiratory alkalosis because of stress, anxiety, a big thing is teaching them prevention. What are some things that they can do to prevent this from happening, avoiding certain situations. And then whenever the attack comes on, what they can do to help decrease that breathing and decrease the stress associated with it. Okay, so that wraps up this review over respiratory alkalosis. And don't forget to check out the other reviews in this series.